mean, I'm going to mute and then I'll just unmute if I have a comment for you. Okay. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, or I guess it depends on where you're joining us from, but uh, we're going to get started right on the hour. So thank you all for waiting and we can't wait to get started. All right, so we are gonna go ahead and begin our webinar today. So on behalf of the Environmental Finance Center Network, welcome to our webinar on the Drinking Water State Revolving Fund, otherwise known as the DWSRF. My name is Avery Davis from the Syracuse University Environmental Finance Center. And before we begin, I'm going to cover a few housekeeping items and then we will get started. During the webinar today, everyone will be kept on mute to ensure audio quality. If you have a question, please type it into the GoToWebinar question dialog box anytime throughout the session. We'll be saving your questions for a facilitated Q&A session um, throughout the presentation. There'll be several opportunities to answer questions. And after the webinar, you will all receive a follow-up email that includes a link to the recording and other information you may need. You can also download the slides from today in the handouts tab in your GoToWebinar control panel. This webinar has not been submitted for pre-approval of continuing education credits, but eligible attendees will receive a certificate of attendance for their personal record. To receive a certificate, a certificate for this session, you must attend for the entire webinar and register and attend individually using your real name and unique email address. Will be sent via email within 30 days of the webinar date. And if you have any questions or need assistance, please contact us at smallsystems at syr.edu. Now for a little bit about the Environmental Finance Center Network. We provide training and technical assistance to small water and wastewater systems in all U.S. states and territories through our building technical, managerial, and financial capacity programs. If your community or utility needs assistance with drinking water or wastewater system management, please feel free to contact us through our request form, um, which I will be sharing a link to shortly in the chat. And on that note, we can get started. So I would like to introduce our presenters for today. We have Maureen Kerner, PE, who's the Associate Director at the Environmental, Cent Environmental Finance Center at Sacramento State um, Office of Water Programs. And joining her is Carol Contenikas, who is a staff engineer also at the um, Sacramento State EFC Office of Water Programs. So let me get those slides up and we will get started. Great, can I take it away? You're all set, Maureen. Great, thank you, Avery. Well, good morning, good afternoon from wherever you're joining us. I'm Maureen Kerner. I have a master's and bachelor's degrees in civil and environmental engineering. As Avery said, I'm currently serving as the associate director 
at our EPA Region 9 Environmental Finance Center at California State University, Sacramento, Sac State. And uh, with that, let's, let's dig in. So next slide, please. A little bit more about us. So yeah, as far as the Environmental Finance Center, um, before we dig into the Drinking Water SRF, I want to mention that we have, as the EFCN, we have a lot of opportunities and support available. One of those is all kinds of different training. If you go to the EFCN network and look at uh, the training events website, there's asset management, financial planning, building resilience, effective communication, all kinds of webinars for a national audience like the one we're doing today. But there's also state-specific um, trainings that, that, that happen as well. So you, you can go there, maybe you already did to register for today, but we also archive the previous ones. Lots and lots of different opportunities and, and resources available to you for training. Next slide. We also have technical assistance available. This is funding from through EPA. Um, there's all the way it usually works is you can go to the EFCN network under their get help um, link and um, fill in a couple, a little bit of information if you're interested in learning more about asset management, operator training, certification, infrastructure funding, fiscal planning. This is kind of catered one on one. Um, expert to system opportunities to really help you either access funding or improve your technical, managerial, financial um, capacity, uh, all kinds of different opportunities as well. Next slide. A little bit more about the Sac State EFC. We are located in the Office of Water Programs, also at Sac State. Um, um, about 50 years ago, the Office of Water Programs started um, a manager and operator training so manuals now we do online courses and certifications probably many of you i hope are using some of our manuals and programs um, and then about 20 years ago we started kind of this applied research program with technical and managerial support and then maybe about seven years ago we became an environmental finance center where we were really able to pull in kind of that those financial aspects so our focus a lot is technical managerial financial expertise and tools for the water industry. Next slide. Give me a minute here. Get on the right slide here. Um, so I think we're ready. Am I on the right slide for today's intent and content? Yep. And uh, so we're gonna cover the background on the drinking water SRF program. We're going to talk about eligible entities and projects, special services for small and disadvantaged communities. We'll do a run through of the applicant and agreement process and really focusing on applications. And then we'll do a recap of resources and support. And then we can open it up for questions. And uh, I think Avery had said that slides will be made available for the, through the EFCN website. And we're going to post them on our Sac State EFC website as well. And then you as participants will be emailed when they're available. Next slide. So let's start with the background on the drinking water SRF. Next slide. So we should be on the first slide for the drinking water background, Avery. Got to keep in track of where we are. Great. So the drinking water state revolving loan fund or the drink DW SRF was established in 1996 by the 1996 amendments to the Safe Drinking Water Act. And that Drinking Water SRF, it's a financial assistance program that helps water systems and states achieve the health protection objectives of the Safe Drinking Water Act. The program is a powerful partnership between the EPA and states where EPA provides funding to, funding to each state and the states contribute additional funding and they administer the program and they also work with eligible drinking water systems. And it's really great that you're all joining us today because there's an unprecedented amount of funding currently available through the bipartisan infrastructure law that was signed by President Biden in 2021. And the, the bill, we call it, is delivering more than $50 billion to EPA to improve the nation's drinking water, wastewater, and stormwater infrastructure. And that's the single largest investment in water that the government has ever made. And, uh, and for water systems, that funding is being distributed through the state drinking water SRF programs. Next slide, please. So 
So under the drinking water SRF, the states can provide various types of assistance. And today we're really gonna focus on the grants and loans options, but there is other assistance like refinancing, purchasing, guaranteeing local debt, and a purchase of bond insurance. But um, focusing on the loans and the grants, the states will rank project applications they receive from water systems, and then they produce this project priority list. Um, to fund those projects. And the states, you know, they can tailor their raking process, but they have to make sure that it meets the Safe Drinking Water Act requirements um, to prior for certain priorities. And in particular, that would be addressing serious risks to human health. They must be necessary to ensure compliance with the Safe Drinking Water Act. And then they also have to assist systems that are most in need. So then the states can set specific loan terms um, which would include interest rates that could go from 0% to market rate, and then repayment periods for up to 30 years. The states can also customize those loans to meet the needs of, the, of small and disadvantaged communities or provide incentives for certain types of projects. Um, and those drinking water SRF programs also have the authority to provide additional subsidization that's beyond a 0% loan. And those would be things like grants or principal forgiveness or negative interest rate loans. Next slide. So here's the general model of the program, the Drinking Water SRF program. Under the program, EPA provides grants to all 50 states plus Puerto Rico, and that capitalizes the state programs, loan programs. The states will then contribute a match to the federal grants, and then the EPA will also provide direct grant funding for District of Columbia, U.S. Virgin Islands, American Samoa, Guam, the Commonwealth of the North Marianas. The, um, and then those 51 state and Puerto Rico drinking water SRF programs really function like inf infrastructure banks. They provide low interest loans to eligible recipients for drinking water infrastructure projects. And then as money is paid back into the state's revolving loan fund, the state can make new loans to other recipients. And so those recycled payments of loan principal and interest earnings allow the state's drinking water SRF to revolve over time. The states will design their program to meet the needs of their states. Each of, each of those 51 state programs plus Puerto Rico are unique. Uh, the state-specific programs operate within the federal framework, but they can target funding more narrowly to meet their specific state needs. Next slide. So as we talk about the state programs today, I want to mention a little bit more about what entities in the state administer the programs. For some states, the programs run by state department, charged with public health, natural resources, or environmental protection. And examples would be like the Hawaii Department of Health, the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources, the Tennessee Department of Environment and Conservation. But then other states have established specific finance authorities, like Water Infrastructure Finance Authority of Arizona and the New Mexico Finance Authority. Next slide. And now we can get into a little more detail about how the drinking water SRF programs work. And it really starts with Congress appropriating funds for the, for the program. Uh, EPA will then award capitalization grants to each state, we said that before, for their drinking water SRF that's based on the results of the most recent drinking water infrastructure needs survey and assessment. Uh, the grants are provided to, to all 50 states. Um, and then the states will contribute an additional 20% match. And then the program also provides funding for the other for territories like we talked about. And, um, and the states can take about 31% of those grants as set-asides. And then after they take, we'll talk about the set-asides in a little bit, but after they take their set-asides, they place the balance of their capitalization grant together with their state match into a dedicated revolving fund. And then they can do, um, the fund can provide low interest loans and other, uh, other authorized assistance to water systems. And then they can use that for additional loans. Next slide. So um, building on a federal infrastructure investment of over 21 billion, the, the state drinking water 
SRF programs and provided more than 48.5 billion to water systems through March of 2022. And that's was provided through over 17,000 assistance agreements for doing things like improving drinking water treatment, fixing leaky or old distribution pipes, improving sources of water supply, replacing or constructing water source storage tanks, and then all kinds of other infrastructure projects related to protecting public health. Next slide. And then finally, just to note that the Drinking Water SRF program does have a sibling program referred to as the Clean Water SRF. Um, and that's really similar, operates similarly, um, but the fun, but funds um, other non-drinking water projects like wastewater treatment and collection or stormwater, energy and water, water efficiency and landfill capping. So maybe if you're interested in that, we can still help you out if you're interested in learning more about that. A lot of similar things here. We'll talk about resources. It's really, again, very similar to the drinking water SRF, um, only for different types of projects. Next slide. We're ready to dig into the eligibilities and entities. We'll go right to the next, and uh, eligible entities and projects. And so we'll start off um, with the, uh, with the eligible entities and the applicants must be a public water system, which is essentially a system that will provide water for human consumption to the public through pipes or other uh, constructed conveyances and has to have at least 15 service connections or regularly serves at least 25 individuals. The states can provide, addition, can provide drinking water SRF financial assistance only to the following types of public water systems. One is an existing privately one would be um, existing privately owned and publicly owned community water systems and nonprofit non community water systems. Now, a community water system is a, a public water system that'll serve at least 15 connections used by year round residents of the area served by the system, or it regularly serves at least 25 year round residents. And a, a community water system may be privately or publicly owned. A nonprofit, non-community water system would be a public water system that's not community water system and is owned or operated as a nonprofit entity like a school. The nonprofit entity could be government owned. And then there's um, also eligible entities would be a new community water system that represents cost-effective solutions to existing public health problems with serious risks that might be caused by unsafe drinking water from wells or surface sources um, or caused by technical managerial financial difficulties. And then in this latter case, the expectation is that, if, that there would be some kind of consolidation with a, with a well-performing um, drinking water program drinking water system. Um, and so with that consolidation, you go into this new regional community water system that can address those, those issues. Next slide. So the Safe Drinking Water Act requires that the drinking water SRF financial assistance may only be provided to eligible public water systems for the expenditure of specific types of projects. And those projects must facilitate compliance with the national primary drinking water regulations or otherwise significantly further the health protection objectives of the Safe Drinking Water Act. And there's really six broad categories of eligible projects. And there's a report associated, here's our cover page um, that you see that includes all kinds of really nice tables. They identify the project categories and offer examples for the projects, for each type of project. So within the project categories, the cost can cover things like purchase of spare parts for capital um, projects. Um, it can co cover large capital equipment purchases like, um, like SCADA systems or leak detection devices and equipment. It can cover standby power generators, database infrastructure, software for like asset management, inventory tracking. Um, it can also cover the cost of vehicles and uh, administration buildings for the water system. So that could be billing offices, laboratories, control centers, engineering departments, um, and uh, decommissioning or deconstructing old facilities to make way for new facilities, acquisition of existing infrastructure, and then purchase of land or other infrastructure that's needed. 
Um, so there's other eligible activities for an assistance agreement that could include planning and design, could be water utility audits, leak detection studies, identification of service line materials, optimization studies, drought contingency plans, all kinds of evaluations that can result in a capital project or in a reduction in demand to really alleviate that need for additional investment. Next slide. So here's an example of one of those project tables and examples from that EPA 2017 eligibility handbook. And so it's a great resource to go through to see the details of example projects for all those different types of categories. And with that, we can stop here and check in for questions before we jump into the next section, Avery. No questions at this time. Oh, unless one just rolled in. Um, someone asked if water source improvements are eligible. Um, yes, typically they are. But again, what I'm going to we'll start digging into or talking more about is you'll you really need to confirm that when you work with your states. But generally, yes, they are. Thank you, and that is our only question. So I think we Great. can move on. Go to the next section, which is talking about small and disadvantaged communities. And so since this training is intended to target small water systems, we wanted to take some um, time to talk about specific opportunities for small and disadvantaged communities under the Drinking Water SRF. Next slide. Okay, so let's talk about a couple of um, definitions as we're talking about small and disadvantaged communities. Um, so small systems are defined by EPA, and essentially it's a system that serves, serves a population less than 10,000. And then for disadvantaged communities, they are defined by the states, and there's all kinds of different ways that the states um, will put definitions together. And a very common one would be something like less than 80% of the statewide medium household income. And there's a great website here, the Environmental Justice um, that, um, that will take you to link it for every state. It gives you the definition of disadvantaged communities. And then just a, a note should be that not all small systems are disadvantaged and not all DACs are small systems. And again, it really goes back to how the states define that. Next slide. So in addition to kind of all these different funding for, for projects and that that we talked about so far, the program has benefits that are specific to small water systems. Like we said, that's a population of over under 10,000. And the benefits can include technical assistance um, if for systems that are uh, not able to, or eligible to apply for a loan because of the lack of technical, managerial, or financial capacity or limited resources, or they need help in financial sustainability and asset management. So that would be things like the ability to operate, manage, maintain, and pay for your system in the long term. The assistance is provided by either state employees or a third party contractor, referred to as a technical assistance or TA provider. And that could be, but that technical assistance could do things like outreach and training, um, technical consultation, or it could be water G or energy audits. Um, so for the outreach and training there, you might do training for system staff and board members about the importance of TMF capacity and how to achieve compliance, or maybe do training on on-site visits to systems experiencing compliance challenges, or um, you could do outreach program, develop, help develop outreach programs that explain the drinking water SRF program and all kinds of different assistance that's available. Um, training could include um, technical consultation, or sorry, uh, ass technical assistance could be more of a consultation type where you do complete an engineering feasibility study to look at operational areas of improvement or operator certification training, um, completion of environmental reviews, preparation of consumer confidence reports, drafting source water protection ordinances, rate evaluations, project development, whole, whole array of things. Next slide. Okay, and then for specific benefits for disadvantaged communities can 
can be technical assistance, similar to the list we just went over for small systems, but they can also receive principal forgiveness as well as low or no, no interest rate loans. Um, sometimes you can get a longer loan term up to like 40 years. I think the standard is usually about 30 years. And then even in some states like California, there's an automatic inclusion on the state's project priority list. And we'll talk about that later. Um, I think you do need to note that just because um, you're put on a list, on a priority list because of your disadvantaged communities, a service that does not guarantee funding. Um, Okay, next slide. And I'll go ahead and talk about this and then I'll check in with you for um, about the application agreement process and Avery and then we'll check in with you for questions. So next slide, which would be the application process and the six general phases. Great, so the six general phases for getting and using funding from the drinking water SRF would be application development, and then review and scoring of the applications. There's um, prioritizing projects and developing an IUP, which is an intended use plan. That's kind of a state level um, effort. And then you go into the agreement execution for your project. And then you get to implement the project and then hopefully all goes well and you get to close it out. And so today we're really just gonna focus on those, those first three. Next slide. So you probably have a lot of questions on how to even get started, particularly in developing and submitting an application. So where do I apply? What do I need? Who can I get help from? All those kinds of things. And we're here to give you some insights. Next slide. And the good news is there's tons of helpful resources like guides and videos and tools. And the states have these resources available on their websites. One of the key ones um, is the actual state staff that are administering the drinking water SRF program. So some key tips for getting started would be contacting your state's drinking water SRF representative. Just know the states really are here to help. Um, they can help you determine your eligibility, your project needs. They can walk you through the application process and then also talk about technical assistance and when it when and how to get involved for small and disadvantaged communities um, you can also review online resources there's all kinds of resources available for training guidance documents that can help you get familiar with your state's program many states have their applications posted online and they will include examples of what information the state um, needs to determine your eligibility and prioritize your project as it relates to the other projects that are seeking funding. And again, that state representative can help compile a list of needs. And sometimes states even have checklists of information um, that's required to fill out an application. And um, they can also provide technical guidance on the next steps. And then um, a big piece too is to assemble your project team, get get help from those who are willing. And that can be, um, that can be it's difficult, but it, in the end, if you pull the right people together, um, you'll, you'll really have a successful application. Next slide. So just wanted to show you an example of the, re of the state resources that are available. This is from the Alaska Department of Environmental Conservation, their Division of Water, and their website provides all sorts of documents and guidance and resources. Um, there's links to um, obtain technical assistance, and then they also have that portal for that uh, for their online applications. So again, you can't can't um, um, emphasize enough the value of going to your websites and contacting your state representatives. Next slide. So state SRF applications are online. Um, many are online. Um, Again, you can get them from the SRF website. Um, some have those portals and um, they're, or they're, they may be downloadable documents like a PDF or something, or sometimes you're able to fill the PDF out um, um, digitally. So um, each state does do some things differently, but there's all kinds of common key elements relevant to uh, the applications. There's generally they want the app 
patient information, system information. They want a summary of the project. What is the project? Why it's needed? How much will it cost? They want an engineering report that shows how the project was selected, uh, a technical managerial financial capacity assessment, um, and uh, fiscal sustainability and asset. That could include fiscal sustainability and asset management. Uh, there's a contract for, you need to provide a contract for engineering services. You want to include plans and specifications for your project, water rights documentations, environmental documents, um, comprehensive response to climate change, and then a readiness to proceed indicators. Next slide. Okay, so let's talk about a little bit about some of these. Uh, there's uh, the preliminary engineering report, and that purpose is to perform a feasibility study of all the potential solutions to the project problem. And there, um, these are the things that would be, so what would be included would be a feasibility study or an alternative analysis. So you describe the problem, you'd, um, what alternatives are considered, how was a final alternative selected, what are those criteria, and then what's the pr pros project? You want to go into the, the, the detail, the description of the recommended alternative. Um, and uh, you also want to include a project schedule, a cost estimate, and then any conclusions and recommendations for, for kind of when you're thinking about the next steps. So regarding technical, managerial, and financial capacity, the Safe Drinking Water Act does require that public water system that applies for a drinking water SRF loan needs to show that it has capacity to ensure compliance. And if the system doesn't have compliance, um, assistance can be provided only if it helps the system achieve capacity. And that goal is really to ensure that the drinking water SRF assistance is not used to create or support non-viable systems. Excuse me, Maureen. Yep. Avery, can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. We're now on the technical manager on financial capacity slide. Thanks. Thanks, Carol. Okay, so when we talk about technical capacity, that's really referring to the physical and operational ability of a water system. And that would be things like assessing and ensuring the adequacy of your source water and the physical infrastructure. Um, it can be uh, the technical knowledge and ability of your system's personnel to properly operate and maintain the system. Um, let's see, for, um, for managerial capacity, we, uh, we often refer to the institutional and administrative ability of the water system. So really, um, the, the, the system's decision makers um, can they conduct necessary activities like staffing, planning, maintaining accountability, interacting with customers, regulatory agencies? Um, so an example would be that the water system must have personnel with the expertise to manage the entire water system operation. Um, and then finally, financial capacity refers to the ability of the water system to acquire and manage sufficient financial resources. That would be things like generating sufficient revenue, maintaining creditworthiness, and managing the water system funds by budgeting, accounting, and then other met methods of fiscal control. Next slide. Okay, so then once you've um, submitted your application, the state can begin its reviews, and that they're going to assess um, that really that all the required forms and information have been submitted and are complete. And they'll look at the design plans for professional practices and sound engineering. They'll take a look at the environmental materials as they re relate to environmental compliance. And, this, and they're also going to assess your system's TMF capacity. And the states actually may require additional information or they might even require revision of some of the materials that you submitted. Um, for some documents like the TMF capacity, um, those the states may allow you to create or modify the required documents as part of the funded project so outside of your application using funds that you've applied for so once the review is complete the state is going to score the application based on a, um, a, a ranking scheme and that scoring evaluates all kinds of different elements of the project that can help prioritize all the projects um, that are um, that are submitted 
from the dozens or hundreds of applications that a state receives in any one year. And that ranking criteria is based on minimum um, criteria set by EPA and each state's ranking system does need to be approved by EPA. Next slide. So this is a list of just the many types of criteria states use to score projects. So are there Clean Water Act or Safe Drinking Water Act violations? Um, do you have afford do you do you need improvements addressed related to affordability? Um, what's the size of the population served? Are there code violations? Is it a disadvantaged community? Um, are water quality considerations and receiving waters? Um, do you have the ability to repay if it is a loan? Um, there's uh, education and outreach components involved. Um, and then if you have fiscal sustainability and asset management involved, all sorts of different ways to go about ranking projects. Next slide. So here is an example. This is from the North Dakota Department of Environmental Quality. Um, they developed this priority ranking system for their program that was approved by EPA. And it's really a 100 point system that consists of um, the following criteria and point assignments. So for water quality, there's a maximum point of um, 35 and water quantity has a 20 point maximum. They look at affordability and you can receive up to 15 points for infrastructure adequacy, up to 15 points. They look at consolidation, if it's regional, um, regionalization or consolidation, they'll give you 10 points, up to 10 points. And then if it involves operator safety, they can give you five points. Um, okay, and then, to, so then from there, once they score it, if to be eligible for the drinking water SRF program, your project um, um, would be ranked among all the other projects that they've received applications for, and then they put it on this project priority list. And then it's put in an, um, in an intended use plan, the state's intended use plan. So once the project is ident identified in an intended use plan, the project can be approved for assistance based on its ranking and available and the availability of funds within the state. And there are certain conditions where lower ranked projects could be funded ahead of the higher ranked projects. Um, and that, um, but sometimes higher ranked projects can be bypassed um, as well. Next slide. Okay, this is what we were just talking about that. Um, that project priority list. So, um, so some states like California will automatically add projects for disadvantaged communities. And again, that, that list, this project priority list is put on the state's intended use plan. And that really lays out how the SRF funds are gonna be used. And it also includes the project scoring scheme and how it complies with the Safe Drinking Water Act and the EPA guidelines. And then that IUP must be available made available for public review and comment, and then it's submitted to EPA for approval. Next slide. Okay, so this is an example. It's the project priority list from North Dakota in 2022. And really it's, it might be hard to see, but at the table lists the systems alphabetically by name. And then that gives the priority ranking in the far left column. The actual points from the ranking criteria aren't shown, but you can see the project listed in the, in the fifth row down is number three in priority, and it's been included on the, on the 2022 fundable list. And really the important thing to note here is just the difference between the programs. So while there's, um, there are similarities, there's not, two, not any two that are exactly alike between the states. Next slide. Check that I'm on the right slide here. Great. Okay, so we've developed and submitted the application and it's been reviewed and scored and the state has issued their prioritization list. And then the next phase would be getting into the agreement execution. So um, assuming your application was successful and made the priority funding list um, a representative of the state 
drinking water at surf program will contact you or the name of the applicant um, or the point of contact on your application and then you'll get started on the agreement and i'm going to stop here as the agreement execution pro progress is really different for each state and uh, it'll take well beyond 30 40 minutes were intended for today so let's move over to kind of recap the resources and support that's available for kind of those first three phases. Um, but first, before I get into that, I'll check with you, Avery, for some questions. We do have some questions. So um, off the top of your head, Maureen, do you know what the lead agency is um, in California for the DWSRF? It's typically the state water board. The California State Water Resources Control Board, but sometimes it could be a local agency like the county. So it really just depends. All right. And then, um, do you know if adding household water meters to a system might be eligible or not? That is a common, um, that's actually a common um, type of project. Yes. Perfect. And, and if we can't get to any of these questions or um, for some reason more research is needed, then we'll we'll make sure to follow up with the attendees as well. So, um, so next, uh, is funding available to help prepare a preliminary engineering report? Yes, there is. So the states, they have funding for constructions, at, you know, actually building infrastructure, but they also have funding for planning and design. And yet that can even include doing environmental reviews or environmental documents. So um, again, if you go to your state's website, uh, you can, they should have different information about those construction funding um, versus the planning and design funding. And then, you know, again, highly suggest picking up the phone, sending out an email to the state representatives. All right, so just, uh, looks like we have three more. Um, so uh, one attendee asked, um, we'll start with a comment. They said the prerequisites for an application um, are costly and can inhibit small systems with limited resources from applying for funds. Do you have any suggestions to help alleviate this? That is right on point. <laughs> As an excellent question and it's so true. Um, and that's where the technical assistance can come in. So, so contact your state representative, ask about technical assistance, but I also, it may even be more, um, more timely or, or, or a quicker response is if we have it later here, is if you go to our EFCN network, get help website and you can fill in like three, to, you know, your name, your, your system, general issue that you're looking, general type of help you're looking for. And we've been helping a lot of systems lately um, small systems put grant applications together or learn about grab grant applications, grants and loan applications. Thank you. And I did put that link in the chat for everyone and I can uh, drop it again shortly as well. Um, and then, so um, someone is wondering if the drinking water SRF covers the cost to connect a private system to a public system. I think it depends on the state. Some, some, some states, yes, and other states, no. So again, it's kind of state-specific issue. Okay, and then um, uh, someone asked if funding is available for an income survey to determine eligibility for the disadvantaged community qualification. Typically, yes. So again, that would be under kind of a planning and design type of loan or grant. So, um, so and, and uh, even the EFCN may be able to help you with that. So contact your state representative um, for the Drinking Water SRF program, or you can reach out to the EFCN and we can give you more um, specific opportunities or, or assist you directly. Okay. Hey, uh they're rolling in steadily, so if, if you okay. want to move on, let me know. <laughs> but okay. uh, we did get another that um, it's a comment. It looked like um, on one of the past slides, a community in Hawaii had self scored their application. Um, do you know if that had been has oh. been done elsewhere? Huh, I, I don't remember 
remember I don't remember seeing that, but had self scored. Um, I think I think there the the scoring details that this that the states would use that the state programs use is documented. So you can you should be able to go and score your own um, project, but I don't believe. But I, I my understanding is that the state staff from the drinking water SRF program would do the official scoring. Um, but again, I'm not an expert in every single state, so maybe some are letting you self um, self score. But I think using that scoring and trying to self score might be a great check to make, especially if you live in a state like California where the there is a lot of competition for the drinking water SRF funding. So um, it doesn't hurt to try to self score and get a rough guess because then you can also go back and see if there are elements of your project that you could enhance to bump your score up more. Right, and then one more question, we can move on. Um, so an attendee is wondering if this funding is separate from the funding available to deal with PFAS mitigation. So EPA does have, um, does have funding for um, PFAS mitigation. I am not very clear on how it's different than the drinking water SRF program. It might be embedded in, in it or not. So that's one, Avery, I think we should jot down and um, we can get back, we can look into it and get back to our audience. Right. Uh, yep, we will follow up with you and that is all for now. So right. we'll carry on. Well, really just kind of wrapping up, we go to our next slide. It's a recap of the resources and support that's available. So if you go one more slide over, um, again, uh, so, so the Drinking Water SRF fund information can be found if you click on this link that's here. Um, and then, and then if you go to the EPA, State Drinking Water SRF uh, has a table um, of, um, of the state contacts and that. And so the contacts really can answer your questions and give you guidance on where and how to apply. Um, I've had been on the phone with a lot of folks from different states, a lot of those drinking water SRF representatives from different states, and they've been super helpful. They wanna talk with people, they wanna, um, they're there to get the funding out and to help you. Um, and so the, the table also provides links to the state specific websites in addition to like an email for a um, for um, the folks that are listed as the contacts on this example table from EPA but you just just a side note that a lot of those folks that are listed may be more at the director level and not necessarily the staff that you'd work with on your individual projects so if you really go to your state website you might find um, um, specific people to reach out to in their contact information that you can talk about your specific project. Next slide. Okay, so we looked at the Alaska example website a little earlier, and here's just another example from California because I really want to impress on you how much information is available. Um, particularly, you can see here like those there's information to get in touch with those project level staff that'll walk through you through the process and decision making for your particular project. So um, again, resources that are common to all the states would be would include background on the drinking water SRF, pretty much what we talked about so talked about today, and then it'll get into the state specific program policy and then relevant documentation and then guidance for developing the applications. Next slide. Okay, so um, there's, again, if there's, uh, I think we talked earlier about the Drinking Water State Revolving Fund Eligibility Handbook from EPA in June 2019. Um, and so here's some key resources they provide. It talks about eligibility, and that's, again, determined by each individual state. And the uh, programs do need, the state programs do need to operate within the federal program, but they can target funding more narrowly. And then each state program, including Puerto Rico, has the flexibility to direct their funding to their particular environmental needs. Um, so the, the website um, does provide information about eligibility from the EPA and the individual states. There's definitions of the small systems and disadvantaged communities. 
Um, and then also in the, the state specific IUPs are great resources. Um, and then there's, um, and then, whoops, I lost track here, this, okay. Yeah, and so there, yeah, the definitions of the small systems in the disadvantaged communities under the association of the state drinking water administrators, which showed that one before. Next slide. Okay, and then this is kind of, again, if you're looking for technical assistance, you can contact your, go through your drinking water SRF state websites or and contact their staff. Um, but also, you know, you can just, send an email or a, uh, or a request through the EFCN Network Get Help webpage, um, and we can connect you with the right people if we don't have the answers ourselves. And I think with that, we can go to the next slide. That's that's what I had today. I can check in. I, let me mention that if you go one slide beyond this, Avery, we do have a list of all the acronyms from what we hear. People get very overwhelmed and confused with acronyms. So we do have a list of common ones that are used for the drinking water SRF program here for you. Um, so you'll get that once the slides are made available. And then I can uh, turn it back to see if there's any question or questions. Any questions, oh, Avery? I'm not hearing yeah, you. Sorry. No, my computer was buffering. I was waiting for it to reconnect. So we did have a couple questions come in. Um, one attendee is asking, how does the SRF funding work in the Pacific territories? I'm not as familiar with those. My The little that I know is that EPA sends money um, directly to the territories and the territories have their kind of set um, projects that they that they work on. Um, and I don't think it's a system by system type of application, but uh, but I'm, I'm still learning about that one. But we can probably dig up some information and share it with the audience. Another one to add. All right, so we have one more question. Um, and if anybody has any additional questions, feel free to submit those or to follow up with us um, via email after the session today. Um, but so it looks like one one attendee asked um, regarding the application process for public entities, do community entities use the same application process? Yes. And then for the last question, um, do you know if tribal nations are available or are eligible, sorry, for the drinking water SRF? It depends on the state, I think. So, and then there's different, um, yeah, there's different scenarios where they are, they aren't. Um, there is the Indian Health Services, I, I believe does have funding as well, um, but you're really, that's a question for, again, you know, reaching out to the state um, program representatives to find out. And then, so one more came in, it looks like, um... Does the technical assistance through EFCN include assisting small systems with applications? Yes, it does. I will drop that link in the chat again, um, just so everybody showed up and late. A follow up to the question about tribal nation eligibility. I will say that I have I, I have projects where they are eligible for the drinking water SF program. And then others, others where they are, they are not. So again, it's really kind of a, a state and kind of scenario specific decision for policy. So, um, so we have another question. Would it be fair to say that the drinking water SRF is not for projects estimated to cost less than one million? I don't know. That's a good question. I, I don't think it is fair to say. I think there would be pro there there are projects that are less than that. Um, certainly, you know, we talked about there's the planning and design um, loans or grants you can get versus construction, and so certainly the planning and design would be less than a million. Um, but I, I would think that there's um, that 
again, that's probably a state policy, but I think that they do look for, especially because, because there's so much effort to support small and disadvantaged communities, there might not be a million dollar price tag. So I would think, I don't know if, that, that, if that's true or not, but I, I would be surprised if it is. So another question came in. Um, so for small water systems, what's the difference in eligibility for those uh, greater than 10,000? So is there a special score given to small systems similar to disadvantaged systems? It depends on the state criteria, really. Sometimes, you know, sometimes um, this, a state will look just as a small system regardless of disadvantage or not. Sometimes they'll only be looking at disadvantaged communities. So it really depends on the state. Well, it looks like that's all of our questions for now. Um, can stick around a few minutes and see if any others roll in. But I'll, I'll go over some of our, our closing notes for today and we can see if any come in uh, during that. So thank you, Carol and Maureen, for presenting with us today. Thank you, Carol, for uh, chiming in with the slide issues. Um, following this webinar, all attendees today will receive a follow-up email with the slides and a link to the recording. Uh, we also ask that you complete our evaluation following the session today. Um, it should pop up automatically once we, we end the webinar, but this is helpful so that you can let us know your thoughts on today's session, and that way we can plan future webinars on topics that are important to you. And I don't see any more questions coming in. Um, so Maureen, do you have any final remarks for the audience today? Other than I hope this was helpful, please reach out if you have questions, because if we don't know the answers, we're all about getting you connected with people that do. Um, and best wishes to you all. Thank you so much. And we hope to see you all at a future EFCN event. And we'll be in touch soon. So enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, Avery. Thanks, Avery. Thank you both.